Several years ago, I gave a talk to the Natural History Society on the Alvarez theory that a meteorite strike had killed the dinosaurs and two-thirds of all living species. No sooner had the Alvarezes proposed the theory in 1980 than a scientific knockdown dragout drag-out fight began. Now, 40 years later, the Alvarez theory has passed every test that anyone could devise. Yet a few aging opponents still carry on the fight. Tonight, I want to tell you about a new theory which proposes that a second extraterrestrial event caused an extinction. This one, when people who looked a lot like us walked the Earth. Some 15,000 years ago, moving from right to left on the slide, the Earth was warming as it emerged from the last great ice age. Then in only a few years, perhaps in only one year, the warming trend reversed and temperatures in North America suddenly plunged by 10 degrees centigrade and remained low for 1,300 years when the temperature rose as quickly as it had fallen. Geologists call the cool period the Younger Dryas in honor of Dryas octopetala, a pretty little flower that thrives in the temperatures of the Arctic tundra and whose pollen are found in Younger Dryas deposits. Just prior to the Younger Dryas cool period, modern humans like us had populated the Western Hemisphere from Alaska down to Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America. Among the most successful were the Clovis, whose artistic stone projectile points have been found throughout North America and as far south as Venezuela. The hemisphere teemed with animal life, turning the Great Plains of North America into a prehistoric Serengeti where bison and horses grazed in the scores of millions. But there were strangers among them, a fantastic menagerie known only from fossil remains. In North America, some 35 of the big mammals, the Pleistocene megafauna, suddenly went extinct. In South America, even more. The horse vanished from both continents and was reintroduced by the conquistadors in the 1500s. Over the decades, anthropologists have debated two rival theories to explain this extinction. First, the slaughter of so-called naive animals by newly arrived skill hunters, nicknamed the overkill theory, or two, the climatic change that accompanied the younger Dryas, nicknamed overchill. Another notable change was that the population of Clovis dropped by as much as 50% at the Younger Dryas, and their beautiful stonework disappeared from the archaeological record. Many scientists believe that climate change was the cause. Scientists had debated the reason for the YD cooling for decades, with one hypothesis after another falling short. One authority was ready to give up, saying, in the end, the initiation of the Younger Dryas may remain a mystery. And not just one mystery, but three. Perhaps it's time to move out of the box, as they say, or rather, out of the solar system. In 2007, a new hypothesis proposed that an extraterrestrial object had exploded in the air over North America, destabilizing the last great ice sheet and launching the YD cooling. The resulting shock wave, wildfires, and destruction of food resources created an impact winter that caused the megafaunal extinctions and the Clovis decline. The scientists nicknamed their idea the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, or YDIH. Let us examine one of the sites the authors of the article studied at Murray Springs, Arizona, near Tucson. On the left is Vance Haynes, Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona, who discovered the site in 1966 and became a leading expert on Clovis and one of the most respected archaeologists. On the right is Alan West, one of the authors of the PNAS article. Haynes pointed his rock hammer at a thin dark layer and said to West, that's the black mat. We found it at dozens of places. 
No skeleton of extinct megafauna has ever been found in or above the black mat, only below it, and no Clovis artifact has ever been found in or above the mat either. Here is a chart from Firestone et al. of a vertical section down through the YDB at Murray Springs. The photograph in the center shows the black mat. The colored dots and lines show the abundance of various chemicals and materials below, at, and above the Younger Dryas boundary, RYDB. We want to look particularly at the orange for the microsphere rules and purple for magnetic grains. Notice how these event markers are zero or close to it, below the YD, rise to a peak at it, and then fall back to their background level. Firestone et al. found the same event marker results at six other sites. So to sum up, at the same instant of geologic time, a thin layer containing elevated amounts of exotic substances was spread over an entire continent. This is just what happened at the time the dinosaurs disappeared, except the layer was global. A slam dunk for an ET event at the Younger Dryas, one might think, but not so fast. The first response to the new hypothesis took only three months to appear. That was too little time for scientists to collect new data to confirm or refute the hypothesis, and indeed the article contained no new data. Its title, Impacts, Mega Tsunami, and Other Extraordinary Claims, did not bode well for the hypothesis, and indeed, the article went on to denounce the hypothesis as a Frankenstein monster. Here is the last paragraph of the article with italics added for emphasis, and I'll just read the italics sized section. Runs roughshod, spectacular explanations, long fishing expedition, shreds of support, played out primarily in the popular press, the desire for such attention, and then science by press release and spectacular stories to explain unspectacular evidence consume the finite commodity of scientific credibility. The desire for attention line is the same argument that climate deniers use against climate scientists, that is, that they know man-made global warming is false and are just in it for the money. In both cases, I say hogwash. Even though this article was all rhetoric, it appeared in a widely read publication and convinced many scientists that the YDIH was dead on arrival. Who wants to give life support to a Frankenstein monster? The PNAS article also reported nanodiamonds, one billionths of an inch in size, from some Younger Dryas sites. Jim Kennett and his son Douglas found nanodiamonds at Arlington Canyon on Santa Rosa Island in the channel, a study site for our colleague John Johnson at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. The Kennets also found diamonds at the Younger Dryas boundary in a Greenland ice core where they could have only have gotten by falling from the air. Surovel et al. had tried to replicate the microspheral peaks at YDB sites, including two of the same sites that Firestone et al. had studied, yet in some cases they could find no microspherals at all, and where they did find them they did not rise to a peak at the Younger Dryas boundary. On this basis, Surovel et al. said that the hypothesis was irreproducible, the kiss of death for a scientific hypothesis. This is the crux of the case against the impact hypothesis, and we must think it through carefully. Scientists are fond of saying, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Just because you look for something and don't find it does not prove that something does not exist. Perhaps it is so rare that you need to look harder to find it, or, if like the Younger Dryas boundary, it occurs in a thin, hard-to-recognize geological layer, you might by mistake have sampled some other layer. Nano-sized microspherules and diamonds can easily be lost during sample preparation and analysis. Perhaps the object you are looking for is hard to distinguish from similar ones and requires special techniques to identify. For example, microspherules derived from several terrestrial sources 
as well as extraterrestrial ones and require special instruments and techniques. Of course, either party, Firestone et al. or Surovel et al., could have made these kinds of mistakes, but there's a big difference in the outcomes. Mistakes could not have manufactured peaks where none existed. Mistakes destroy order. They do not create order out of randomness. To illustrate, here is a chart showing a vertical section down through the KT boundary in Italy that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. The Iridium Peak was the clue that led the Alvarezes to the meteorite impact theory of dinosaur extinction. Had the Alvarez team made mistakes, mixed up their samples for example, or lost half of them, that would have destroyed any existing Iridium Peak. Suppose then that another group had repeated the Alvarez study but reported that they could detect no Iridium or that it occurred randomly rather than peaking. Would scientists then have declared the Iridium evidence irreproducible and thrown out the meteorite impact theory? Of course not. They would have said that a peak can be found only if it exists and that those who fail to replicate it must have made mistakes in procedure. Evidence must overrule absence of evidence or we have gone down the rabbit hole. In 2012, another group conducted a blind test to, to try to replicate the microspherule evidence. At sites where Surovel et al. found no microspherules, this group found hundreds. At the Blackwater Draw site, common to both Firestone et al. and Surovel et al., this group not only found abundant microspherules, but a substantial peak. They pointed out several errors in the Surovel et al. methodology, most importantly that they had examined the microspherules only under an optical microscope, whereas Firestone et al. had used a scanning electron microscope and X-ray spectroscopy necessary to distinguish ET spherules like those shown from terrestrial ones. So despite what Surovel et al. wrote, they had not followed the same methods as Firestone et al. Over the years up to the present, microspherules have been reported at many YDB sites in articles by dozens of authors. No scientist who used SEM and XRS has failed to find the YDB microspherules. It was the Surovel et al. finding that proved irreducible, yet scientists let the reported absence of microspheral evidence overrule the positive evidence that Firestone et al. had reported. Then in 2011, digging the hole still deeper, came an article in a major review journal titled The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, A Requiem. It ended with this paragraph. Scientific hypotheses are constantly being proposed, tested, confirmed, or cleanly rejected, but a small minority of these stray from this time-proven path. Many scientists are unaware of the surprising number of hypotheses that have gone badly astray, often after widespread initial interest and support. Then three books are cited. Characteristics of these wayward hypotheses include claims that are spectacular, data that are subjective or at the limit of precise measurement, and criticisms met with ad hoc excuses and or shifts in the original claims. We suggest that much can be gained by stepping back and looking at the broader lessons for the earth sciences, impact science, archaeology, and other affected fields. Those three books are about pathological pseudoscience unidentified flying objects, cold fusion, extrasensory perception, eugenics, the Jewish science of the Nazis, perpetual motion, and so on through a dreary list. The authors of the Requiem paper were not content to say that the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis is false, but that it is no better than claims of flying saucers and alien abduction. I have read many scientific papers and I have never seen statements like these. They are far outside the bounds of proper scientific discourse. 
Let us return to the nanodiamonds, also claimed to be irreproducible. The authors of the Requiem paper wrote that they had searched for them in the Channel Islands at the same locations where Kennett and others had sampled and where the Kennets had found both microspherules and nanodiamonds, but the Requiem authors could not find any of either. They wrote no clear YDB marker bed was present in any of our sections, so our results focus on spherules through sediments predating, dating to, and postdating the onset of the YD. This is tantamount to saying we did not find the YDB, so of course they did not find nanodiamonds, as this peer-reviewed paper noted. Samples were acquired up to thousands of years younger and older, completely missing the YDB age layer. This oversight explains the reported absence of YDB nanodiamonds. Like the microspherules, nanodiamond peaks have been found at many YDB sites. One test of the hypothesis is to recognize that an ET event is instantaneous on a geological time scale. To state the contrary, if the YDB were found to be of different geological ages at different sites, it would likely not be of ET origin. But Jim Kennett and others found that 23 YDB sites have the same age within the precision of the method. This does not prove the YDIH, but could have disproven it. Another test is whether scientists have found diagnostic impact markers at YDB sites. The presence of elevated iridium, as at Gubbio, Italy, is one such marker. Some reported finding iridium at the YDB, while others could not. Another impact indicator is quartz shocked under high pressure. Again, none has been found at any YDB site. These two absences turned meteorite impact specialists against the YDIH from the get-go. Then came the claims of irreproducibility, and for these specialists, the case against the YDIH was closed. Iridium belongs to the platinum group of elements that tend to be enriched in meteorites and whose presence thus suggests an ET event. In 2013 came a report from a group at Harvard that they had discovered a platinum peak at the YDB boundary in a Greenland ice core at least 100 times the background level. This finding led other researchers to look for platinum enrichment from continental YDB sites. And they found it at these four well-studied YDB sites. One of the findings reported in the original PNSA paper was evidence of widespread impact-induced wildfires at the YDB. In 2018, Dr. Wendy Wolbach of the University of Chicago and colleagues confirmed that finding at many sites around the world. In 1984, I had the pleasure of awarding her baccalaureate diploma from Franklin and Marshall College, where I was president, to her. As of 2018, scientists had not found an impact crater of YDB age. This was one reason proponents of the hypothesis proposed the explosion of a comet in the air, which would not have left a crater. The absence of a crater logically could not be considered evidence against the YDIH, but still the discovery of one would greatly strengthen it. Then came a peer-reviewed article reporting the presence of an impact crater buried one half mile under the ice of Greenland, called the Hiawatha Crater. Without a sample of rock from the crater to date, the researchers could only say that it was between about 38,000 and 11.7 thousand years ago, and thus could be the missing crater. We hope they will drill down and retrieve a sample of rock from the crater. If you go from image A to B to C to D, you can see the different perspectives. C is the radar image, D is a color enhanced image, and those little dots in the center of the crater 
are central peaks, small cone-shaped mountains like those found in the craters of the moon. If the YDIH is correct, then when new YD sites are studied or old ones restudied, they will date to the YDB range and contain microspherules, nanodiamonds, platinum, and the like. During 2019 and early 2020, scientists reported on five such sites. Drill cores from a dried up lake in the Czech Republic called Stara Jemka showed 17,000 microspherules per kilogram at the YDB, the greatest number found at any YDB site. Another and very important site was at Palauco, Chile. It had long been known for the presence of fossils of gomphotheres, an elephant-like mammal that, like the mammoth and the mastodon, went extinct at the Younger Dryas. You can see it's way down at the southern tip of South America, and the excavation site is right in the, in the town. Palaco not only has peaks in microspherules and nanodiamonds, but also in melt glass, platinum, palladium, gold, and native iron. It has a layer that resembles the black mat and shows evidence of extensive wildfires. Bones of horse and other big mammals are found below the YD at Palauco, but not above it. The most important thing about Palauco may simply be its location. It lies 3,600 miles south of the nearest known YD site in northern Venezuela and 7,500 miles from the northernmost one in Canada, showing how far flung is the evidence for the YDIH. One important fact is that while the northern hemisphere cooled with the YD, the southern hemisphere warmed, the seesaw effect, as scientists call it. Yet the same kinds of great mammal extinctions occurred at the same time in both hemispheres, showing that climate change was not the cause of the extinction. The rise of agriculture was a pivotal event in human history as a way of life based on hunting and gathering by nomadic tribes gave way to a more sedentary existence in farming. Archaeologists believe that one site in Syria known as Abu Huraira captures this transition. Here's one of the dwellings uncovered by archaeologists at Abu Huraira. Earlier this year, an article reported microspherules, platinum, palladium, gold, melted rock, quench droplets, and the other things shown on this slide at Abu Huraira. They concluded the wide range of evidence supports the hypothesis that a cosmic event occurred at Abu Huraira 12,800 years ago, coeval with impacts that deposited high-temperature melt glass, melted microspherules, and or platinum at other YDB sites on four continents. If this is correct, then a younger Dryas impact may have helped to launch the transition to agriculture. At White Pond, South Carolina, a well-known archaeological site in that state, researchers found platinum and palladium peaks many times background as well as evidence of wildfires. The last of these five recent articles described an archaeological site called Wonder Crater in the Limpopo province of South Africa. It dates exactly to the YDB and has a platinum spike 20 times background. Last spring, an outstanding scientist named Wallace Broker died at age 88. He was generally acknowledged as the greatest authority on the Pleistocene, the geological epoch in which the Ice Ages and the YD occur. Over his career, Broker had endorsed one theory and then another for the cause of the Younger Dryas, rejecting and sometimes resurrecting each theory as new evidence came in. Then came the discovery of platinum in the Greenland ice, and Broker changed his mind once again. The Greenland platinum peak makes clear that an extraterrestrial impact occurred close to the onset of the YD. Perhaps the object was vaporized in the atmosphere, accounting for the shape of the platinum peak. If it's good enough for Broker, it's good enough for me. 
This table summed up the evidence reported in peer review articles for the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. That this evidence is reproducible cannot be denied. In my opinion, there is a clear preponderance of evidence that an extraterrestrial event launched the Younger Dryas. So with that accepted, let us close with the question of whether such an event could have caused the Younger Dryas cooling, the megafauna extinction, and the decline of Clovis culture. As shown on the map, something spread the effects of the YD event over half the Earth's surface an event of that magnitude could have brought on an impact winter that explains the YD cooling. What about the disappearance of the Clovis culture? Scientists often attribute it to climate change, but does that make sense? For some 10,000 years before the Younger Dryas, Paleo-Indians had survived an ice age in nearly everything that nature could throw at them. To shrink the population of Clovis and destroy its culture must have required something with which they were unfamiliar. But with climate change, they were all too familiar. In any case, the temperature change at the YDB would have been uncomfortable, but not fatal. Not nearly as bad as moving from Fort Lauderdale to Cleveland, where the temperature drop in January averages 42 degrees. I know something about that trip as I once made it in late December. However, I wisely went from Cleveland to Fort Lauderdale to play tennis. As for the megafauna extinction, the two theories are, again, climate change and overkill. This slide shows how the black mat is sometimes draped right over megafaunal remains, showing how sudden the extinction was and how closely it is associated with the Younger Dryas boundary. This certainly suggests that whatever caused the Younger Dryas also caused the extinction. Let us take the horse at a case study. Equus has been around for 50 million years. The idea that a temperature change of a few degrees could have driven scores of millions of horses to extinction across the entire Western Hemisphere strikes me as ludicrous. As we noted, the horse also went extinct in the Southern Hemisphere, where the temperature change was in the opposite direction, cold to warm. You cannot have it both ways. Overkill posits that Paleo-Indians crossed an ice-free Bering Strait and migrated down into the Great Plains, where they encountered naive species who had never met human hunters and then slaughtered the hapless creatures into extinction. But no horseman or horsewoman can be persuaded that human hunters on moccasined feet and armed with primitive weapons with an effective range measured in feet could have hunted a myriad of wild horses to extinction. I can't even catch one of my own horses and he is supposedly domesticated. To round up wild horses using motorized vehicles hasn't worked, so the Bureau of Land Management has had to resort to Judas horses and helicopters. Replace the helicopter in your mind's eye with a band of people on foot with bows and arrows. Whatever caused it, the Younger Dryas changed Earth history, biological history, and human history. Without it, there is no reason the horse should have gone extinct in the Western Hemisphere. Its survival would have changed everything. This painting shows on the right Cortez mounted with a helmet, allegedly scuttling his tiny ships in the harbor of Veracruz. The Spanish chronicles tell us he had 500 men and 13 horses. On the left are the soldiers of Montezuma shown on foot as they were. The horse had gone extinct. But suppose instead that Cortez had met tens of thousands of mounted Aztec horse archers molded by a Western Hemisphere horse culture thousands of years old. Or consider Pizarro and his small band of men and horses in Peru. They faced Atahualpa, who had an 80,000-man army, all on foot, of course. But suppose that instead, half of Atahualpa's men had been mounted. Guns and steel would surely not have been enough 
and the Aztec and Inca empires would have gone on for centuries. Had the horse not gone extinct, it would have been hasta la vista, conquistadores, adios, Spanish conquest. Whatever its cause, we can ask what if the YD had not occurred. Without the Spanish conquest, many crops native to the Western Hemisphere would not have reached Europe for centuries. By one estimate, the potato was responsible for one quarter of the growth in world population and urbanization between 1700 and 1900, most of it in Europe. The horse was likely used first not for war, but as a source of meat, one of its several indispensable contributions to human society, along with milking, plowing, transportation, hauling, and leather. The first evidence of horse domestication dates to 4800 BCE on the Caspian steppes. This brings us to that indispensable invention, the wheel. Its earliest depiction in prehistoric art is this Neolithic pot, inscribed, as you can see, to the right of the center with a sketch of a wagon with four wheels and a shaft for a draft animal to pull it. This was found in Poland and dates to 3500 BCE. Our words for horse and wagon derive from the ancient Tripolite culture of today's Ukraine, which may have been where people first used animals to pull a wheeled cart. The Tripolites made miniature wagons with wheels, perhaps as children's toys, or perhaps they were replicas of full-scale wagons. Native Indian cultures in Mexico and Central America also made wheel toys, like this one shown, but because they had nothing to pull them, never scaled up these playthings to the real thing. The idea of a disc that can serve as a wheel may have naturally occurred to people at various times in human history, but only cultures with horses and oxen to pull a wheeled vehicle conceived of any reason to take it further than a children's toy. In Guns, Germs, and Steel, Jared Diamond tells of a New Guinean named Yali who asked him, why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it to New Guinea, but we black people had little cargo of our own? We could paraphrase Yali's question to ask, why did Native Americans not turn out to be the equal in invention and accomplishment of the Europeans who arrived on their shores? Why did Native Americans not invent gunpowder, learn to sail out of sight of land in wind-powered vessels like the Vikings, and discover Europe? What if part of the answer is because of the setback of the Younger Dryas and its aftershocks in the Western Hemisphere? Is the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis proven? No, we do not ask that of a theory. All we ask is whether it explains the evidence as well or better than any other theory. As I hope I have shown you, with no rival theory that it can explain the trifold mystery of the Younger Dryas, and with a mountain of reproducible evidence behind it, the hypothesis has earned a seat at the table, even at the head of the table. Thank you, and I'll now look forward to answering your questions. <laughs>